<laughs> Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Today's guest is here to talk about corrections. Now, anyone who's paid any attention to me knows that one of my big issues is I want to reform the absolutely broken correctional system. Today's guest it can be a lot of help with this because he knows something about it, having spent 20 plus years within the walls of Connecticut's correctional institutions. Not just an ex-con, though. He's also an author of several books. Welcome to the show, Kamathi Kama Watson. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, Michael Leibowitz. I am so happy to have you here. You and I go way, way back. So there's one series of incidents, a theme that occurred that we were both involved in, and I think it exemplifies corrections. And what I'm talking about is the series of events that began with the strip search of William Howell, Bill Howell. Do you remember you you remember what I'm talking about? Yes, we we're both working in industry. Uh, for anyone to know, industry is basically a manufacturing department, manufacturing industry that the Department of Correction has that they were actually making license plates. We were making uh, uh police boxes. We made a bunch of stuff inside there basically for the Department of Corrections, but it's the industry based job. It's a work related job, but it's a work release job that we we're doing. So yes, now, I remember. Now, if I'm, if I remember correctly, at the time that this series of events started, you had been working there for about nine years, right? Yes. I've been there for, I've been there for almost a decade. Yes. Yeah. And you had an exemplary record. You were the you were a clerk, you were the top fabricator, nothing but yep. excellent work reports. Uh, they promoted me to the top position because I took an interest in what I was doing. I took a genuine interest because CNC manufacturing was something that I had an interest in. And it was along those related fields. So I was actually, I learned MIG welding there, I learned TIG welding there. I will never take away the opportunities that I presented for myself, but this was an opportunity that I had. But yes, I, I was actually training. I trained other individuals, I trained other inmates on how to use these machines to try to give them the skills that they may need, basically transferable skills to go into the outside and mm -hmm. learn. So yes. And while incarcerated, you were never a problem inmate, no history of violence. No, 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 no. And, while I was like inside, that. they literally within my 24 years of incarceration, I think I had two two infractions. And one was for failing to let an, a correction officer uh, inspect a cassette tape <laughs> when I was like literally probably about my first year in. And the other incident was an incident that I had inside the market shop, which, which is that. So I didn't I know I was pretty much a model inmate. I went inside there with my mindset that I made a mistake and I took the steps to try to correct myself. Okay, so what occurred initially with Bill Howell? Well, Bill Howell, that situation was, if, I'm, if we want to go, I can go back into what happened was is the, the, the COs didn't like that they felt that, I guess, we were getting so much that the industry workers, now we have to, well, first you got to give some type of context so they can understand. Okay. Industry, industry workers are considered, I don't want to say they get a little bit more leeway, but industry, because well, we're doing something for the DOC in, in contrast to somebody who's just sitting around slacking off doing nothing all day. So, so some people look somebody, at us like privilege, right? When you work. Yes, so, somewhat, but I, don't, but I don't want people to take that and run with that. So you get you get minor things that because we're working inside here, that, so we'll get it. But we don't get away with nothing. Obviously, you got to follow the rules, but you get a little bit more, little, little more leeway. So long story short, the CEOs on the opposite side, they felt some type of way about that. They yeah. felt that maybe that's that staff or, or industry personnel or other correction officers weren't being as harsh as they, as they would with other, say, quote unquote, for the sake of argument, regular inmates. So because of that, you had some CEOs that were trying to do certain things that were a bit beyond what they were supposed to do personal basically it was a personal vendetta so because they felt personally instead of them being professional to say you know what whatever they're doing as long as they're within the rules and regulations and the following rules they took it upon themselves to say i'm going to check these guys i'm going to do all this extra stuff to basically make life harder for us when it was unnecessary but we already know as us we are moving as it's just a part of what they do yes so that incident occurred where they were basically saying that they wanted to do the, the strip search. I'm not sure if you're, if you're going to that, it was strip searches. Yes. Which so, they can do. There, there's yeah, there's nothing. They can do that every day if they want. Right. Yes. But what, to, what, it, what they did is they took it upon themselves to go above that. Say, you know what, I'm going to personally strip them where even when it came down to, they have a certain, they have a certain area where they're supposed to strip us just to give their, their, their viewers context. 
there is some rules and restrictions that the Department of Corrections are supposed to follow where they're supposed to only strip us in certain areas. Now, once they, and that's for, that's for safety for us and it's obviously respect for women staff. So yes. what they were doing is they decided to strip us in areas that they weren't supposed to strip us. In a there's common probably, area. Yeah, in, in a common area where they can see us. That was one. Two, they're supposed to be respectful. They're not supposed to tell an inmate, take your fucking clothes off, which is what <laughs> they did to me, instead of saying, you know, take take your shirt off, hand me your shirt, or take your clothes off yeah. and throw them on the floor. It's clear signs that I'm just trying to rattle you. I'm yes. going to try to bother you because I have the power to do that. And who can you complain to? Yes. And then well, so many words. But, but uh, Kamati, back up just a little, because before we get to what happened to you, okay. I want to w- w- talk about what happened with Bill, because that's what set off the chain of events. It's interesting to me because this happened 11 years ago and it's still thinking about it. I can see irritate you highly. And I understand why having lived through it. I mean, it was, it was a a, a sickening abuse of power. So, so you mentioned now where they, where they strip searched bill that day, when you enter industries, right, there's a hallway and there's these glass sliding doors. That we yes. can see through. And there's another room where they strip search us, which, yes. like you said, that's fine. They only strip search us once in a while, you know, once a month, every two months, whatever. But on this day, there was one CO doing the strip search, and he decided to do it in that common area, right? Where yes. if there's female staff members walking by, they can see you, whatever. Yes. Now, it's, just, you- it's just a tactic to basically degrade you, but yes. Yes. Now, do you, how did Bill react? Do you remember? Cause I remember I, I wasn't there that day cause I didn't stay overtime. It took place on overtime, but yeah. how did Bill react? From my, from my understanding, honestly, I didn't see too much of how Bill reacted. I know the backlash that I received from Bill. So yeah. with how Bill reacted, I don't really recall. And I don't, the only reason why I said it is I don't want to give, false information so i do remember he didn't act obviously he didn't act favorably towards it but i know the backlash of what happened to me is what was next is i ended up getting i guess feeling the wrath of that when they ultimately came and and the correction officer told me take your fucking clothes off well slow down for the love of god (laughs) we're gonna get to it i I know i know it pisses you off but before that happened they tried to fire bill Yes. And they tried to fire a couple other guys that complained about it, right? Do you remember this? Yes. And the guy, but they couldn't fire him. No, because so they're not doing anything wrong. No. So now at industries, there's an officer. The, the officer that did the strip search is the officer assigned to work at industries. So every day, Can I, say his name or no? say, I don't care. Edelson, I'll say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Edelson, yes. And if you want to, if you really want to read about this incident, buy down the rabbit hole how the culture of corrections <laughs> encourages crime. So yeah, Officer Edelson, and he worked on there. So once the, he didn't get his way and guys didn't get fired, there was about a month of, of transactions or interactions that took place before we get to you. What did he begin to do? Do you, re- do you remember? I'll help you. I can fill in the blank. Oh, yeah, I no, have it written down. But what he started doing is he started to basically go through our lockers. He would take our locker stuff. He, he, he would basically take all our stuff. For individuals to know, we have personal lockers that when we bring down and we can bring coffee, we can bring little personal items that we have. This officer decided to take it upon himself instead of just basically going through our things, determine if there's any contraband, which he's well entitled to do. All of these things that they're well entitled to do, he decided to take our contraband and throw it all onto the floor. Which was not the normal thing. Which is obviously, absolutely not a normal thing. You don't take someone's coffee out of a bag and dump it on the floor. There's no contraband risk. There's no safety and security. No. But, and people need to understand, and I, and I try to get this across, that you become accustomed to living a, a certain way. That yes, there, you're. it's true. He can go through our stuff every day if he wants to. But yep. when they don't ever do that, yes. and then all of a sudden they get a hair across their ass and start doing it every day. Yes. It, it's disruptive, to say the yep. least. It, well, it's I, like... I, I, but go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You're here. No, you're the guest. It's, you talk. It's, it's, it's not it's not only just disruptive. What I think that people just don't fully appreciate is it creates a psychology of a person inside there that they're basically saying, I know that these people don't give about give a crap about me. And if you didn't have that type of personality where you wanted to do better for yourself, you can transfer that unto yourself to say, I am a piece of crap. I don't I don't deserve anything. Look at how they're treating me. Because yes. they'll tell you blatantly, not 
not and there's no subtlety there's no you're a piece of crap you're a piece of shit you deserve to be here and i deserve to punish you so that so when you have this type of mentality day in day out and people got to understand even though we're adults and we can be rational even a rational person, if somebody who isn't psychologically sound, if a person isn't mentally fit, if a person needs help working on themselves, to, to can, can constantly do this to someone every single day. Try to hold your phone like steady. That. Your phone is kind of bouncing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just no, no, you don't need to apologize. Uh, just just correct right. it. <laughs> All right. So it's like people would need to understand that that's the type of things that people are being subjected to. Right. And that will message you. And not only like that's one side of it where a person will start to say, I'm a piece of crap. Look, you know, I deserve this, whatever. But there's the flip side, too, where they start to say this entire system is unjust. Everybody's corrupt. I just happen to get caught. They're criminals, too, and start to view ourselves as victims. Right. So it can go either way, neither of which is helpful to the uh, goal of criminal rehabilitation, which is what they're charged with doing. Yes. Which they don't do. No, I mean again, you can, there. There's there's programs inside there that that people. But even, and I'm going to say this in a nutshell summary. And I remember someone said this to me, and actually a counselor. And I'm not going to repeat this counselor thing, but actually a counselor said it to me when I started up another program called SOS. He said, "Think about that. Put it. We're going to use an analogy of a drug dealer and a drug user. And a drug dealer has no incentive to get a drug user clean." That's right. And it's unfortunate to use that type of parallel with the Department of Corrections, but the individuals in corrections, they, on the surface, I would say that they do certain things. And I believe that they are good and hearted intentioned individuals inside there that do want change. But for the most part, it's in their end. It's not against, it's in their, not in their interest to clean out the jails and to have everyone go home. That's an individual responsibility that someone has to do. And that's right. the problem that the Department of Corrections is tasked to do they're not, I just don't believe that they're ever really going to. Oh, well, if they it. fixed everybody, they'd have no more jobs. Exactly. <laughs> right? and I actually had staff say that to me. Yeah, to of say, course. I mean, if you do this, then what did, and I've actually had staff members say, well, who's going to fix my coffee? Who's going <laughs> to mow my lawn? Literally, I had a staff member tell me this. Who's going to mow my lawn if you guys all get out here and you get these great jobs and do all these things? And I found that I was like offended. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not your job to even think like, and that's what she said to me. Yeah, I, I, I've had him say that type of stuff to me, too. Yeah. So, All right. So back to Edelson. So he's not just though going through our stuff, right? They started strip searching us it, where it used to be once a month, every two months. Now it was every single day. Literally every single day. Right. And not only that, you need to tell them about what happened when the captain came inside the air. When a woman captain came inside the air, he kicked his feet up and he basically told her, go tell the rep. She told me, open the door. He didn't yeah. even want to open the gate for her. Now, this no. is a... This Hold is on. A you said something officer. important, though. His superior officer, because he wouldn't let the th- uh, two inmates come to work or three inmates come to work, she said, you have to open this door and let them in. He put his feet up and said no. And who did he say he was going to call? He's, he's, he's going to call his friend. His rep, right? Yeah. His union rep. Because that's always yeah. important when having these discussions, that they're protected by the union. And yeah, he knew that there was nothing they could do to him. Yeah. That he could d- blatantly disregard a superior officer telling him what to do, gave him a direct order, and he refused. Yes. And, and superior, no, that see, and that's what honestly, and I'm speaking this, and I can say this with sincerity. That's what that is a scary thing, and people could downplay that, and people could minimize that. That's a very scary thing to have somebody in this pop position of power who knows I'm going to have the protection of somebody, and, yes. and basically nothing's going to happen to me nothing's going to happen to me. And I can be so blatant with it. I can tell my superior who's yes. going to go over that person. That's yeah. a scary situation. Yeah. And again, people may not, they can downplay, they can minimize it, they're criminals. It's a scary situation because we're being put in compromising positions where if an individual isn't intelligent enough, if an individual doesn't know how to handle that, their go-to reaction is to be violent. Their go-to reaction is to I'm going to do what I know how to do and react in this way. Right. And you're not saying that it would be okay. It's just a fact. It's just what it is. Reality that that's being created by someone who shouldn't create this. Yes. That there's ways to deal with people ways. Not, I mean, he even went so far as we used to get ice brought down. So when we have our juice or water or whatever, and he went so far as to stop letting us get ice. He shut shut all that down. 
yeah, he went out of his way to just be cruel. Basically, there, there's two th- th- things happening here. He wants to punish the, the, the wrongdoers, you know, the people he sees as wrong, but he also wants to turn everybody against them. Because he knows that inmates were not the we're not the most rational uh, group of folks, right? No. And it gets to the point where you might start saying to the guy, "Hey, man, why don't you just quit the job? Why do we all have to go through this because of you?" Right? Yeah. That type of stuff happens, and that's what he's trying to stir up. So you're talking about a group of maybe 40, 45 guys half of which are charged with murder, the rest violent offenses of some sort or the other, and you're trying to stir up trouble amongst this group of people and there's no consequence for doing that and everybody yeah. knows that he's doing it it, it yeah. wasn't a mystery yeah and, and and see that's why i say it's so troubling because you would think that someone with logical rational sense would say let's stop and think about this for a second you're trying to rile up and i don't want to put it in so many in just crude words you're trying to rile up a bunch of murderers Yes. Who have access to weapons. <laughs> Literally, you have access to weapons. And yes. in, an, in, a, in an environment where it's caged off. So even if they decide to react and do something, it's going to take some time to get back up down here to help. Yeah. What are you doing? Now, when what you're saying you weapons, we ha- we got down there razor knives, oh, hammers, no, no. We have, pipes. We have hammers, this, shoot, anything. We have pieces of shards of metal, that scrap metal. People have to under, and, and again, it, take, it will take, for, stop it, stop it. It would take people to understand, they would have to be in that situation to understand how hostile and volatile things could have went. If, if and, and, and I, I actually commend a lot of the individuals inside there for exercise and restraint, because guys could have literally went left and not they would have been totally in the wrong, but it would have been a reaction. And again, just to clarify, they would have been wrong. It's no way that I'm going to justify and say that someone should use violence to combat violence. No, but you I'm would understand that. why. Yeah, and it, 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 it would, I would hope that someone will say, let's start to put some of the blame where it should be, where too. Should we hold these guys accountable for their actions? Absolutely. When you commit something, uh, there's no justification for doing something like that. But let's also take into consideration, if you keep poking a bear and the bear acts more violently, let's look at the person who poked the bear as well. Look at the poker as well. Okay, so now this goes on for, I forget how long, but I'm going to say about a month, right? And then this all led up to the day that you've been itching to tell us about. And it's what I really want to hear about. And and the reason I want to hear about this, because I want to make this clear. Kamati, the guy I'm talking to right now was an exemplary inmate, an exemplary standing in the inside the prison, inside the industries. He was not an issue in the block. He wasn't one of the guys that you've probably heard me talking about or read about that's yelling and screaming and playing basketball and always getting into things. You're talking about someone that all he did was read, play chess, and write and type his books and go to work, right? So you're you're not talking about a problem at all all and it's very important to understand that it's vital because he had been down there for almost a decade and was one of the i'd say top three most valued inmates in the industry's program but maybe the top two so you, you have to keep that in mind okay now so the day arrives and they march us all down the hallway and we got to get the daily strip search that we've been subjected to for about a month now what happens next well, again, yeah. So we that day, again, we knew that we were going to be random. To, we we're going to be subject to these to these searches. We knew that things something was going on because he wanted to do it individually. Now, just to give you guys context, there's a certain time frame where they do in there where they do the industry, and there's a certain time frame that they let out bulk bulk in. Yeah. Now, normally, typically, they would like they obviously would have to have other officers assist them in order to make sure that they get the time frame to make sure that they could let bulk bulk in out. This individual officer, first he decided to do it on him on his own, but even then they decided that it was because it, it was personal. He wanted to do it on his own to try to degrade each person individually. He didn't. So that day, I just happened to run into him, and when I ran into him, when I went out there, I tried to avoid him. He purposely said, "You come here." I followed the rules, but when he came up to me, he said, "Take your fucking clothes off right now." Obviously, that's against protocol. That's against policy to ever tell an inmate, yes. take your fucking clothes off. So what I said is I said, I'm not dealing with you. I said, I'm not dealing with you. I went to the other officer and I went to the other officer and I said, you can strip search me. 
And he said, I'm giving you a direct order. Get the fuck over here right now. Again, when he was coming at me in that manner, I felt that you you're, you can't talk to me that way. You can't act like this and think it's going to be acceptable. Sure. So in order to avoid any confrontation, well, my wisdom, so, so in order to avoid confrontation, I went to another officer and the other officer actually was like, okay, and he allowed me to strip him. When I tried to step out the room, Edelson pushed his hand out in order for me to try to bump him to try to get some contact. And when I backed up and, and went away, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. He said, no, you're not. You disobeyed a direct order. And I said, your other officer strip me. You don't have to strip me. And he said, well, I told you I'm stripping you. I'm giving you a direct order. Take your fucking clothes off. I said, I'm not doing it. He called the code. And for anyone what is a who code? Knows, you had to tell a code. What's a code? Yeah, a code. A code is basically a distress signal that other officers send to basically signal that they need help. That now that help could come in the form of a fight. That help could come in the form of medical attention. But it's basically a code. So it signals other officers to the area where it was taking place, which is the bulkhead industry. So when he called a code, several or he called the code as a distress signal, as far as like a like a fight code, like a fight was about to take place. A code orange is a baseball, code blue is a fight. So yeah. I'm not sure if he called the code blue or code orange, but he called the code. Now, Which tells other the other officers it's serious. Yes, yeah, yeah. It basically alerts the other officers to let them know another officer needs immediate attention. It's, it's something serious about to go down. So when the other officers rushed down there and seen that there was no incident, they were saying what's going on. And that's when they said, Edelson said you tried to fight him. And I it blew my mind. I was like, I, I, it was it was almost laughable to me. Yeah, and so I was I said, there. It's it's just not true. Yeah, and, and I said, and lie. I went to the. I and and what was so bothering to me is I went to the other officer and I said I tried to fight him, and the other officer just lowered his head. He literally went like this. And I said, seriously, I said I tried to fight you. I tried to do something. I said, you know damn well I didn't try to fight you. I just told you I wasn't talking to you like <laughs> yeah. that. Now and let me just say, let me just say something that this why beyond it being untrue, it's so laughable. You're what about six one, six two, right? Six two, and I was about two sixty at the time. Two sixty. Edelson is about five four. He's a little chubby guy, right? Yeah. If you tried to fight him, you'd kill him. I mean, let's, yeah, no, not only that. If I tried to fight him, I would have fought him. But I, I don't. That's he, not my. No, it wasn't. wasn't in my mind. Like, no, and it wouldn't. Yeah. You were a person who had been in prison at that point. That was 2012. So you had been in prison for 15 years. Yes. And no violence at all. No, none. none. Not a single yeah. incident of violence on my yeah. record. And you've got this little roly poly. He's, you know, <laughs> five, four. And he's saying, this guy's trying to fight me. What yes. trying means, I don't know. But it was me. clearly false. And everybody there knew it. That's what yes. that's what I think is important. Everybody knew what he had been up to. Yes. Everybody knew that this was pure BS, that you did not try to do that. Nobody, even if they weren't there, that knows you would have believed it. No. You and and yet what happened next? What happened was is when I said, I'm going back to the block. I said, I follow protocol, I follow the procedures, and I said I allowed the officer to strip me, he stripped me. And he said, I see, so he said, I, I stripped him. He, he acknowledged that. So I said, I'm going back to the block. And he said, no, you're not. So then the lieutenant came up and that her name was, well, I want to say her name, but she came up and she actually pulled me aside and she said, what's going on? And I told her what's going on. I said, this dude's, a, and I don't want to don't know if I can curse, but I said, this dude's, this dude's not right. I said, this guy's not right. I said, you know what's going on. He's been messing with us all week long. He tried to get at me. And I said, he tried to strip me. I didn't even want him stripped. stripping. So I went to the other officer. I had him stripped. He stripped me. He found nothing on me. I'm not stealing nothing out of the I didn't do anything. So I wanted to leave. He told me that I can't leave. And she said, well, he called the code and he tried to say that you tried to fight him. And I said, you know damn well I didn't try to fight him. And she said, well, unfortunately, once an officer calls a code, we have to do our jobs and we have to take you to SAG. And I said, no, you're not. I'm not going to SAG. I'm going back to the block. I did nothing wrong. And they put up basically a wall in front of me and said, no, you're not. You're going to say. And I said, this is bullshit. You know, this is bullshit. You know what he's doing. You know what he did is wrong. And they said, we're sorry. He called the code. We have to follow pro our policy and procedure, which is to take me to say. And they took me to say. They, and in, handcuffs. in handcuffs. In oh, handcuffs. No, they, 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 yeah, they, they don't just me. they don't just say, hey, let's go to say. They put oh, your you know, hands behind they, your back, cuff you and march no, you down they, the hall. Again, I, I, I was sorted. I was just like you said, I was treated. Stop it. I was treated basically like I 
committed the crime. Yes. Like I did something wrong. So they handcuffed me. They took me to SAG. They, you know, I lost my job. I lost my housing. Everything that I worked for for the past so many years was just down the drain. Yeah. Just you like were that. transferred out of the facility. Oh, yeah. No, right? yeah, they, they transferred me out of the facility. But okay. I don't know if they know this as well. They also transferred me out of the facility because they said that they were actually, because they felt that they, they, didn't, they wasn't sure how things were going to go. Because they were like basically, they knew I was upset. Now, they had no idea that I wasn't going to do anything ridiculous. But I think a moment of clarity came to them to say, this guy screwed this guy up. Yeah. He really screwed him up. He really screwed him over. And if I was a vindictive, vindictive type of person, that if we leave him here, some he could do something. Or if it's the opposite side, right. if this guy feels like he didn't get enough punishment, I'm going to do it again. So they was like, you know, let's, let's just transfer him. So I actually, I lost everything. They transferred so, me out. The door. I was so out. 15 years since you had committed your criminal offense, which yes. led you to prison. You've been working on yourself up to this point to make yourself into a better person. I know it. I know that's true because I was there. So I'm not just taking some criminal's word for it. I, I know the truth of the matter. You were reading, working on yourself. You I, read, good, I read some of your books. <laughs> yes, you did. You were in good standing down at work. And then because of an officer's vendetta against another inmate, you ended up being treated like you had committed a crime all over again. Put in yes. handcuffs march down the hall. The reason I want to really drive this point home is because you're talking about somebody in Kamathi that is trying to make himself a better person. And my whole thesis is that the Department of Correction does nothing to correct. It, if anything, exacerbates the problems. Now, I want anybody out there to put yourself in the position as hard as it may be to do of somebody that's working like hell trying to make themselves into a better person knows he did a horrible thing on the street is in prison paying for his crime trying to be better and this is how you end up being treated and just imagine how difficult it would be to stay the course in that set of circumstances to keep going and say you know what i'm still going to be do the right thing and i'm going to try to be a good person when you think of all that now consider this were you given so much as a disciplinary report Anything, any infraction that you committed that led to this? Is there anything no. in your record that would indicate you did anything wrong? No. Nothing, right? No. So even they, meaning the, the powers that be, the lieutenants, captains, correctional officers, whoever would deal with that type of stuff, deem that you did nothing wrong, and yet you were swore at, you were... What's the word I'm looking for here? Degraded. Degraded. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. You were degraded. I was belittled. Were, oh, yeah, I could belittled, name marched off in handcuffs. Yes. That's what we're dealing with. Now, this is the, the, the key for me is not that the same thing happens all the time, but the arbitrary nature of what happened and the sort of disincentive to change that was involved here. Is that unique? within the Department of Correction? No. It, it's an everyday occurrence. Well, see, right? and, and that's the, the thing. In is, smaller is, or bigger ways. Yeah. Well, see, and just like, to me, one of the biggest things that I've learned, and this is going, and not just with that incident, that was not that was an incident that was personal to me. So I could understand how your viewers may see my passion right now, because that was personal to me. That sure. Was very personal. I don't blame but you. On a, on an objective level, what it is, is to me, if I had to gripe with the Department of Corrections, it's the culture. The culture of the corrections is basically these guys are trash. We can do what we want to do. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to protect the ones that do these things at, the, at, at any cost. And instead of it being a situation where there's a moment of clarity with some someone who I would, with, this is the most troubling, like I'm saying is, you would think a superior, you would think someone in the higher up would say, stop, we can't do this, or at least have this safeguard where someone could say there's, there's a relief. Like, I'll give you another example. I don't want to go off topic here, but you have a grievance procedure because sure. you got to think about this. For someone who doesn't understand the, 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 the Department of Corrections, there is a grievance procedure. There's a grievance policy that we're supposed to have in place for individuals who have gripes or who have, or have complaints against another officer. 
where you're saying, you know what, an officer comes through and he and he turns the lights off. For anyone who knows that they're supposed to turn the lights off at a certain time. Let's yes. say don't turn the lights off. Or an officer who, again, has a personal vendetta out and they're doing certain things like tapping on your door or not giving you your mail or certain things. You have a policy in place. It's a grievance policy yes. where you're supposed to. And, it, and it's a three step. It's a three tier policy where you're supposed to write the grievance. If you don't get the results you want, you can file an appeal. If you don't get the appeal then you can go for one last last, last final, you know, in a, in a tribunal, you know, hold on one the, second. When you go and you ask for the grievance, when you say, may I please have a grievance, what, what is the, almost every single time when you tell the cop or the the correctional officer, may I please have a grievance? What do they always say? Well, I don't have, I don't don't have to go to your counselor or something like that. That's the other thing. But what about this? (laughs) Yeah. Spell my name right. Yeah. Because they know. It's no, it's Nothing's no gonna come of it. Nothing. Yeah. It's a joke. Yes. And I, well, well, just, to me, I, I look at it, it's like a kangaroo court because yes. it's like basically it's like asking, it's like asking your I would say and I don't want to put it in this term, but it's like asking your accuser for mercy. But it's like basically the very individuals that you're complaining is against is the individuals who you basically leave it in their hands to make the decision. Right. Right. So it's like me coming to you and saying, hey, Mike, I'm going to write a grievance against you. Could you enforce this for me, please? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, you know, when it, the Department of Correction tried to have me physically assaulted, right? When Brent and Brent McCall and I wrote down the rabbit hole there, we were told we couldn't share what was in the book with the other inmates. Right. Fine. Yes. We won't. So what the officers did was they started to leak things that were in the book. A lot of the time lying about what was in it. And they were d- deliberately trying to get us hurt. I mean, it wasn't hidden. And most inmates said to me, listen, they're trying to get you hurt. And I would say, will you go on the record? Hell no, I'm not going on the record. But one inmate finally agreed to go on the record. So I wrote to the chief state's attorney and I said, look, these people are trying to get me beaten up. I cited the statute that they were violating, the criminal statute. And the chief state's attorney wrote back to me and said, the Department of Correction will do its own investigation into this matter. And I'm thinking, <laughs> it's funny because when I went on trial, I didn't get to do my own investigation. Exactly. I didn't get to have my buddies come sit in, in the jury box. No, oh, that's a nice dog. But, yeah. but, but that is, that's what you get is they, they're investigating themselves. There's no accountability. And I tell people, look, if I were to, were to tell you, you're going to have a business or, or an organization where everything that they do takes place behind closed and locked doors. So no one sees what goes on. They're protected by a union. So you can't fire them. There, there's nothing you can do to them. And the only people likely to complain are the people nobody cares about anyway. Yeah. It's a recipe for disaster. So- yes. So people, I'm sure, are, you know, some people are thinking, well, you know, these guys, they're here and they say that the the Department of Corrections does nothing to rehabilitate them, yet they see you, you know, you're looking sharp, you got the beard, you got a nice apartment there in the background. And they're saying, well, this guy, he seems smart, he seems rehabilitated. So how do you answer that? If the Department of Corrections didn't do it, how how did you change yourself? How did you improve? Well, one of the things that I could say for me, I can't speak for anyone else, for myself, when I committed my crime and I committed an egregious crime, you know, I, I did something that I don't want to repeat, but it was something that, again, play, I'm going to live with for the rest of my life. Yes. But when I went into the Department of Corrections, that was a re- I went to the Department of Corrections as a 24 year old man. I came out as a 48 year old man. So when I went in 40, how old? Well, I'm sorry. You got you. were How old when you got out? I was 48. I was 48 okay. years old. When I so 24 up. years. Yes, I did 24 years then. One of the things that when I first went in, I had someone, I would say I did, I did a reality check on myself and I did a lot of soul searching. And I basically went back to thinking about what I did in my life as cumulative. What did I do in my life as a whole, as far as me going to school, as far as, and then I started to think about what, what did I, what did I do to make my parents proud? Like, what did I ever do that I could say that? And I started looking at sports and I started looking at certain things. And I thought to myself that when a parent sees a child and, you know, and they're in the stands and they see their son or child playing basketball, hockey, football, they're proud. They can say, wow, I did this. And and that's, you know, I, I raised this child and this is a product of what I raised. And for some reason, I don't know why that really hit me. 
And I said to myself, I didn't really do much in my life to ever make my parents proud. I never did anything to make them, you know, proud of me. That started with my parents. Then I started to think about myself as a person. And as myself as a person, I started to think, wow, the things that I was doing, I was a real like dirtbag out there. So, and I'm just saying that to be polite. I'm not trying to, you know, obviously use more yeah. colorful language, but I took it as an oath to myself that I said, I'm going to try to, I'm going to change. I'm going to, for myself. It didn't have anything to do with Department of Corrections. It had nothing to do with my, it was for me. So I, I made a conscious decision to say, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to be different. Now, I needed the tools. I'm not going to say that it happened overnight, but I needed the tools. And that's when I began to search out tools to try to change. But I made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to change. And I stuck by that principle. That's what it was. And so, you had to do it. You had to search had out to, the yeah, tools. Yeah, it, right? it had to be. I had to be. And again, there are some programs within the Department of Corrections that I will say will give you some of the tools, but it's more, it's, it's basically you have to do it yourself. There's not going to be anything inside there that I've seen. We actually created a program called SOS, and it's about individual responsibility, taking accountability for your actions, and all these things that we did as inmates, as prisoners, came together and do. But so to me, it had to be something that I decided myself. So I took a made a conscious decision to first say that I'm not going to commit any acts of violence. I'm not going to hurt anybody anymore. I'm going to take the, the, I would say, I would call it the higher route. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to allow, I'm going to basically at any cost, I'm not going to allow anybody to take me out into a place where I'm going to commit acts of violence. So as a result, I'll walk away. You can call me names. You can call me a palm. I'm whatever you want it to be. I, but I, I wasn't going to like, and, and fortunately that worked, that that I said, I'm and, and People respected that. People respected that. I'm, I'm not a small guy. You see, I worked out religiously, so it's not like I wasn't a big guy. People knew I could hurt you if I wanted to. I'm exercising this restraint. Not only for yourself, I'm doing this for me. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to be a violent person anymore. So, But it took me to take a, make a conscious effort to say, I want change, and I made those steps to change. And you did change. And yes. you're a good man, Kamathi, and I'm happy to call you a friend to this day. Absolutely. Okay, well, it. it's time to wrap up. Where can people find you? Where can they find your books? Yes. Well, I actually wrote my own autobiography. It's called uh, The Death of Me, Accounts of Street Life, Incarceration, and Skills of Socialization. And it actually takes you through the steps, my growth. It takes you through the times when I was on the streets and all the, obviously, the destructive things that I was doing on the streets, which led to my incarceration and the, basically the soul search and the revelation that I had while I was in SAG and while I you know, basically throughout the course of my incarceration and the steps that I started to take to rehabilitate myself. I have other titles, The Anonymous Black Files, which is a three-part series, which actually is a, it's a couple's book, The Health of Relationships. I have a couple of titles called Hail. That's basically my take on how to, it's, it's, it obviously these are fiction titles, but it's basically an attempt to say, what would we do if someone could take all the drugs away from society and put a legal alternative in which will offer jobs and and, you know, basically stop with destroying black and Latino communities. But so just but if anyone would want to basically see my growth and development, the book that I put out is autobiography title. It's called The Death of Me, Accounts of Street Life. Accounts of, it's, it's called The Death of Me, Accounts of Street Life, Incarceration and Skills of Socialization. OK. And where can they find it? They can find it on Amazon. It's on, it's on all, uh, Amazon. You can find it on Kindle Direct Publishing. You could actually read it for free, page reviews, but Amazon, Amazon Publishing, you can find it. Okay, and they would have to look for Audley Watson, correct? Yes, Audley okay. Kamathi Watson. All right. Thank you very much, and thank Absolutely. everyone for tuning in. Mike, now- I want to thank you. I want to thank you personally, and I want to tell you that seriously, sincerely, you're a good dude, and I appreciate everything that you did for me because there was a lot of things that, and I don't want to embarrass you on this show, but you, there was some books and there was some things that you've seen that you put in my hand, how to man think it this certain thing. And I appreciate, I'm sincere when I say this, I'm sincerely, I appreciate what you did because some of the tools that you gave me and before I used to go into, uh, he's a white guy and this, but you came at me and your approach, how you came at me was very genuine, sincere. And I'm sincere when I say this. I actually mentioned you in my book and I say that you were one of the inspirations that really helped me a lot. I was on a path and I, but you, you kind of, I would say you, you, you kickstarted, you not to kickstarted it, but you accelerated it. And I appreciate you for that sincerely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And for now, this is the Rational Egoist. I'm Michael Leibowitz signing out. Remember, like, share, comment, subscribe. Till next time.